How's it going, everybody? Welcome. Thank you for joining me. I see you guys on Twitter. I, I know you want the scoop on what is going on with Cesar Pena, Pena and DJ Envy and the this Breakfast Club real estate scandal. What What is this here? Is, uh, is DJ Envy going to be charged? I mean, is this a serious case? I, I see the questions for sure, and I, I have answers for you. It, I mean, at, at first, I'm like, this is getting a lot of coverage. I'm not super familiar with these guys, but you know what I am familiar with? Wire fraud in federal court. I've covered many wire fraud cases. And uh, uh, safe to say this is a very, very serious case for uh, Cesar, for sure. I, I mean, this is about as serious as it can get. Uh, well, he, he'll get a federal indictment soon. I'm sure that's, that's inevitable. But uh, yeah, this is a very serious case. And it looks like it's been, um, you know, pretty out there publicly for a long time that there's you know, some kind of allegations, some kind of scandal, at least some very disgruntled people who've dealt with him and his wife over the years with all these lawsuits that were that were seen. And I know the big question that people have is what is DJ Envy's exposure on this? And is he going to get charged? And, you know, would be one big hesitancy with these uh you know, legal affairs uh, coverage. Let, let's talk about the indictment and just kind of sit and spit, spit for a while. Is uh, it's very speculative. I mean, we don't know for sure what's going to happen. I did reach out to DJ Envy's lawyer. He hasn't gotten back to me. If he does get back to me, the idea that he's actually going to tell me anything substantive is is weak. But I, I, I think people who've watched my live streams before have probably heard me talk about how, especially in white collar crime, federal crime litigation, so much of what defense lawyers do and what uh, white collar crime defense is, is pre-indictment stuff, behind the scenes, trying to fend off a federal investigation, trying to thwart a federal investigation. And when I just look at the history of this case and what has been out there in the press, it's so obvious to me that that's what DJ Envy has been doing. I mean, they, the idea that this just came from nowhere for Cesar is unlikely. You know, they've <clears throat> likely been getting some document subpoenas or, or something. What was interesting to me was that they arrested him on what's called a complaint in uh, federal court here. I'll, I'll bring it up here. Um, because in federal court, they like grand jury indictments. Usually we see uh, the, the, the typical process is they'll unveil a grand jury indictment and the person will be appeared, uh, appear in court on that way. Uh, but with uh, we, we do see complaints from time to time, and it's kind of a, a quick way to charge the defendant. And when I hear about wire fraud cases, my first question, when you're trying to gauge like, the seriousness of it or just the severity of what they could be facing here. I always want to know what the dollar amount involved in it is because sentencings for wire fraud depend on the dollar amount involved. And you'll see stuff like a sentence can go exponentially higher depending on the more hundreds of thousands of dollars or millions of dollars that you get. So one thing that's interesting about this complaint is it's, they, it was a little hard for me to discern like what actually is his single wire fraud charge here for and what is the dollar amount. But it's also just really apparent that this is not his final charging document. There's going to be some kind of indictment that probably has a lot more charges than just one wire fraud charge. And usually the reason they would come out with a complaint like this uh, so they can arrest him is when they're also serving search warrants. And there's some kind of concern that, you know, the defendant is going to be tipped off to a looming federal case and is going to, uh, and is going to, you know, obstruct the investigation might, might thwart documents that could be responsive to the subpoena. So usually when you see a complaint, I, I don't want to say it was rushed out, but just the fact that they're arresting him on a complaint and not a grand jury indictment shows that there's like something behind the scenes that that spurs them to do this. And uh, one example I had of this was Michael Avenatti, who was the uh, lawyer who represented Stormy Daniels when she sued uh, President Trump. And he was all over you know, CNN and MSNBC 
in 2018. And he, he was just a total fraudulent lawyer. He was in all sorts of financial trouble in uh, California on it uh, and ended up getting indicted on wire fraud charges and <clears throat> sentenced to 14 years in prison. And his, what was the final dollar amount? It was like, it was like 10 million from his clients or something. Yeah. 10, 10.8 million. And uh, another uh, well-known uh, wire fraud case of recent was uh, Elizabeth Holmes. Uh, Elizabeth Holmes is the uh, Theranos uh, woman who was sentenced for fraud. What the other year she got, how many years did she get? She got like, she got like, oh, 11.25 11 for so like three counts of wire fraud and one count of conspiracy to commit wire fraud. And wire fraud is kind of an all encompassing charge for basically just like transactions, like sending money over the wire for like a misstated purpose or something. And, and it's the way the feds get jurisdiction over it because it always involves interstate uh, commerce. They're not, it's, it's not just confined to one state when you're, when you're using, sending money over the wire like that. So the feds are able to get jurisdiction, but uh, just the idea that uh, uh, actually Evan Nadi was, had a couple of cases competing at the same time. Uh, the California feds were working on a grand jury indictment against him. And then they get word from the feds in New York that they're going to arrest him in the Nike extortion case. So this was a couple years ago, but that's when the feds in California turned around and rushed out a complaint. They didn't have the grand jury indictment ready for Michael Evanati, but they got word from New York that he was going to be arrested in the extortion case. And so they were worried that once he got arrested, like his secretary and all the people that they wanted to target with search warrants would, you know, be destroying evidence or something. So before he was arrested, they wanted to get the search warrants out uh, in California. So they they rushed those out and then also arrested Ebenati on a complaint. And then a few weeks later is when he got hit with the grand jury indictment. So, I mean, it's just inevitable that uh, Cesar is definitely going to get indicted. I mean, there's, there's going to be a big grand jury indictment and he's going to have a lot more than just one count of wire fraud. It's just right now it's unknown why they rushed this out. Why is he being charged by complaint right now? And why didn't they wait for a grand jury? And one thing you see in all this is that, I mean, just how close he worked with DJ Envy on it. And I mean, I've seen all the, the, the chatter and all the, um, all, all the promotion and they even, uh, they, they, they even talk about how, um, you know, he used his celebrityism to really to really attract a lot of a, a, a lot of attention to this. So the idea that they're not also looking at DJ Envy is just totally improbable. And the fact that Cesare was charged first, I mean, a lot of these times in a lot of these cases, the feds are looking for somebody to cooperate. And if they think they can put pressure on somebody early on and make him kind of wake up and realize it's like, I'm facing a significant amount of time for, in prison for this. And the way to get that reduced is to cooperate with the feds and they can, uh, they can do all sorts of things with his, with, with what he's actually facing. So his, his, with, with the serious case like this, the way to kind of rattle the cages and get people to talk is to charge somebody and arrest them initially. And what, what I thought was interesting is I saw the uh, conflicting reports on whether he's actually, uh, whether there was actually a raid at, uh, at uh, the uh, iHeart studios. And to me, it's just totally improbable that they're not also serving search warrants at the time that they arrested him. Like the same, like when they, when they have the complaint, they've, inevitably also got search warrants that they're uh that they're looking at but i i know this stuff's not the most reliable source but w one thing that is important to do when you're paying attention to what they're saying and and how they're saying it is is what exactly they're saying about a raid like they're a lot of the times they'll uh they'll uh kind of mince words here reports that federal officials raided the iheart radio office and removed electronic equipment are not true it's like, okay, so does that mean there were no search warrants served anywhere? No, there's no, like, like I said, it is improbable that they arrested him and didn't also serve search warrants. There were definitely search warrants served. It's just Massimo D'Angelo, who probably spends more money on dinner in a month than we make it 
in, in a month, says that it's not, um, the reports are just another example of the continued se sensationalism in the media to attach his client's name to the story. And this to me is the biggest sign that Envy, I mean, Envy knows something's coming. There's probably been some document subpoenas or something, or there's a grand jury proceeding and he has knowledge of people being called to that because he's definitely lawyered up because the thing that um uh struck me when i was googling this last night was here i'll i'll change it over here my my old employer my old friends at alm and law.com uh and this is an example of why i say like when a lawsuit is filed i'm usually pretty hesitant to just write a story about just a lawsuit being filed because it just ends up being huge publicity for the plaintiffs on this. And here it is. It's Massimo D'Angelo from Blank and Rome at work. And the, and the reason ALM and law.com is interested in this is because of Massimo D'Angelo. Well, well not, not Massimo himself, but because he works for Blank and Rome. That's a major law firm. And ALM, law.com just caters to those people. And you'll hear uh, the, the law firm, a prestigious ranking for law firms is if you're an AMLAW 100 or AMLAW 200. And that's from ALMLaw.com. It's from the American Lawyer magazine. And there's a whole interesting story about the marketing and public relations industry within the legal field and how it kind of birthed from the American lawyer and like the awards that they would give out and the rankings that they give out. And there's some good to be said for the ALM like 100, 200 rankings. And the most tangible thing I've heard is that it it has led to a huge increase in pro bono work in the legal community because the when you make a, a law firm ranking uh, partly dependent on how much pro bono work is done, like how much free legal work they do for people who can't afford it. it. It becomes a component in the ranking. So law firms start doing that. So that's one good thing I've heard about the AMLA 100, 200, but it's, it, it becomes a huge publicity thing. And the reason law.com and ALM is interested in this DJ Envy case in Massimo D'Angelo is because blank and Rome is one of those AMLA 100 firms that they, uh, Everybody wants to know, you know, who they're representing, what they're doing. So the fact that DJ Envy hired him is, I mean, I mean, just a sign that they're not, that he's taking this seriously and he knows what's going on. And the biggest thing that I saw with this, with this article, this is about a lawsuit that he filed against uh, um, Tony the Closer for, you know, who has a large social media. He's, I guess he's on, on YouTube too, saying that he's defamed him over this real estate thing. And to me, this just screams, uh, this, this is part of uh, Massimo D'Angelo's efforts to try to stave off any kind of federal indictment or to, to uh, go on the offensive as part of his defense. Like this is definitely all part of a, an overall defense for a white collar criminal case. It's just part, part of it is publicly going on the offensive and filing a defamation case. But in the end, the biggest truth against defamation and or, or the biggest defense against defamation and libel is is truth. So we might be uh, we might be seeing that here. Um, oh, I just got a call here, but uh, uh, it's um, um, oh, I actually just got a call from from that guy. I could have answered it right there, but eh, probably not. But um, to me, that's just the biggest sign that they obviously know something's going on behind the scenes and Massimo's job right now is to try to try to stave this off and to, and to, you know, be the fixer behind the scenes and prevent any kind of grand jury indictment from coming out. So the big question will be, would Caesar have any kind of motivation and any kind of information to go after DJ Envy? Like that's my kind of question is here is, is who would the feds see as the bigger fish to fry? Are they just after Caesar? Or are they hoping that Caesar flips and cooperates and then they can get an indictment against DJ Envy. It's, it, it's hard to say, but definitely when just, just the looks of it and, and who DJ Envy has as his, as his lawyer, here's, here's, here's Massimo here. He's, he, he can, he can, he can fix things for you, man. He'll, he'll get things done, but um, co-chair of the real estate in, industry team. What's interesting is he, he has white collar defense and investigation. So that's, and that's what this, this is like I said, so much of white collar criminal defense is, you know, not so much jury trials and actually in court litigation, but trying to stave off 
uh, federal indictments and working with the U.S. Attorney's Office behind the scenes to try to try to stop these things. But uh, the complaint here for um, for Caesar. I mean, just the fact that his nickname is is flipping NJ. I mean, I was I was kind of struck at how blatant some of this stuff is, and and just the paper trail of all the lawsuits from uh, people who've been suing him over the years. I mean, I, it looks like a lot of those people who have been suing him are named uh, victims in this case. So it's just kind of a a matter of how many are there and how how many more are there going to be, but. Um, I did see somebody, I, I saw a write-up of of the complaint that put the total dollar amount at like $17 million or something. But that's the biggest debate in wire fraud cases. If it ever goes to conviction, the debate at sentencing is they, they always try to uh, argue over what the actual dollar amount is. Because like I said, the actual sentencing for a wire fraud case will defend uh, depend on the... Uh, on the dollar amount. So let me see if I can pull up that, uh, the guidelines that show you how the dollar really matters because it, it it's kind of unexpected when you see how fast it goes up for like $50,000, because a lot of these thieves in the wire fraud cases are dealing with like millions and millions of dollars. So, but you just see how, I mean, even there's even a difference between 6,500 and, uh, 15,000. Like this is how the feds sentence for wire fraud. And I'll, I'll bring up the other sentencing table later, but you start at a, a base offense of seven and, and then it just depends on how much money was involved in your crime. So if you're talking $17 million, I mean, you're looking at a 20 right here. So that gets you up to a 27 and it's like, okay, what does that mean? And there's a, a sentencing table that the U S sentencing guidelines look at. And um, it depends on your criminal history, but this is the sentencing table. So that last thing we looked at had the base offense level of seven. So just no dollar amount involved. You're charged with wire fraud. It's a base offense level of seven, which for somebody with no criminal history, that's zero to six months in prison. But it never stays at seven because that table we just looked at shows how many points get added for how much money is involved. So something between like nine and a half million, it's a it's an add of 20. So you go down to 27 and 27 brings it up to like 70 to 87 months. But then there's all these other factors that can go in. Like if he has vulnerable victims, like if any of these people were elderly or anything like that, that can all be that can all be factored factored in. So it, it's definitely a, a significant time. And also one thing I, I'm just assuming that he has no criminal history. If he has a, a criminal history, it could put it, put it up there, but you'll just kind of see how uh, these, these things factor in on that. I did see that his, uh, his court appearance, he appeared before a magistrate and was released on like bond and electronic monitoring. It didn't look like it got any coverage. It's in uh, district court in a uh, federal court in New Jersey. And, you know, there's just so much going on back there. And unless you're like, absolutely like have a, have a office in the courthouse or something. And I mean, district of New Jersey is not the big courthouse that gets covered out there. It's uh Southern district of New York and everything. So it doesn't look like, I don't think anybody actually went to his court appearance, but those court appearances are really just routine. I mean, the, the big thing is going to be, uh, if there's any kind of bail hearing on him, which that might have involved, but usually in these white collar crime cases, they aren't uh, in custody before trial. But uh, if he gets convicted, he's definitely uh, he's definitely looking at some significant, uh, significant, significant time here. And I saw somebody comment on on Twitter, but I mean, it's just kind of known that the idea that that people are going to beat charges, especially in federal court. I mean, this, the, the idea that this would go to trial, I think is unlikely, but especially in these financial crimes, when they've got all your business documents, you know, they've got, they've been able to subpoena the bank and get all the bank records. I mean, the idea that you're going to be able to like take this to a jury and defend it and, and win, especially when you've got you know, the victims that remember that will, will, will come into trial. The, the people who are listed in the indictment who are in, in suing him. Oh, uh, who are, uh, who are, who are suing him. I mean, 
I don't know them personally. I don't know anything about like how they would come across in court. But a lot of the times, these times, these people are pretty sympathetic. And the idea that, you know, these people going to court and testifying isn't just, just going to ruin him and ensure he gets convicted. I mean, these cases just are not the most like triable cases for uh, defense attorneys. And, um, Oh, somebody says he does have a uh, criminal history for credit card fraud. That'll, that'll be interesting because um, some, somebody says he's never been to prison before. But like even a, even a charge that like didn't result in prison, if he has a felony conviction or something, it will it could be factored in somehow to that. So somebody asked if I can find the, the mugshot because it's federal court. They actually don't release those. So. I mean, unless you can get like somebody at TMZ to like pay off somebody at the uh, at the uh, the jail where he's at, because but but especially e even those people, like if they're willing to send out mugshots for just the jail inmates, you know, they might do that. But the federal inmates are usually in like a different sect or something, and they're they're being uh, they're being taken care of uh, uh, elsewhere. So the idea that we're ever going to get the mugshot is. No, unlikely. Um, but yeah, this whole, I mean, I was just reading through this and thinking it just sounded really blatant. And he must have been on warning about this for a while, or he had to have like kind of seen this coming. I mean, federal indi or federal charges and federal search warrants don't just come out of nowhere. You know, and especially if he gets indicted sooner or later, that's going to mean that there were grand jury proceedings with like the victims testifying. I mean... I don't know if people from his <clears throat> his real estate area were were testifying, but I, I know the big question and the, just the big question mark here is is what's Envy's role in it, and is he going to be indicted? And that's just kind of an unknown factor of who do, who does New Jersey see as the bigger fish here? Is it DJ Envy, and they're trying to get Caesar to like flip on him, or is it uh, or are they fine with just going after? Caesar. I thought it was interesting. I went to the Twitter page for the District of New Jersey, but they uh, they announced this, and they didn't really get a lot of love on uh, on Twitter. But they've uh, they've got the press release and everything out there. And I mean, yeah, just the idea that they're gonna like go easy on him or or be willing to cut him some kind of you know really lenient plea deal or something. Here, here's the U.S. attorneys. Quote, New Jersey real estate investor and online influencer charged with multi-million dollar investment fraud scheme. Uh, Pina exploited celebrity status in social media to develop a devoted following of potential victims. It's like, yeah, I mean, just the whole format of these plays. I mean, I, I mean, I'm kind of getting into it with this, these YouTube lives, but just the whole format of just, you know, sitting around sitting around chatting for like an hour and a half. It's all live streaming. It's like, oh, what could go wrong here? But just like the kind of the the grifty aspect of any kind of like, I don't know. I, I mean, it just seems like the red flag, the red flags on this were all over the place. <laughs> but any kind of like real estate, like, like flipping get rich scheme, it's usually too good to be true. But, you know, I mean, we'll, we'll see. Um, the thing is, the, the, the way this operates with uh, any kind of search warrants or anything like that, it's uh, unlikely that, I mean, those aren't a matter of public record. Like they, they were approved by a judge, but they're sealed somewhere. So it's not like his search warrants are just going to be filed in open court, like any search warrants that were served on this. But it is completely improbable that they're not serving search warrants on this. Like I am willing to believe... Um, uh, Massimo D'Angelo that, you know, anyone who, that, that there was no search at iHeartRadio and anyone who thinks the feds are serving search warrants in this or just, you know, being sensational or whatever, but, oh, come on, man. Like there are definitely search warrants being served. Uh, somebody asked who Cesare's attorney is and he, you know, I, I didn't see one, uh, a case actually created in the district of New Jersey yet, but he's got a bunch of lawsuits going on and, um, a state court in New Jersey that he must have attorneys on, but uh, those are all going to go on hold now that he's, he's got the criminal charges. Like there's not going to be any litigation or discovery going forward in his civil cases because the criminal case is much more serious and he can't, he shouldn't be participating in any kind of the, the litigation on that because it could screw him over in his criminal case. So 
his lawyers in his civil case like might be working with him right now, but uh, the idea they might not be completely qualified to represent him on this. He needs to find somebody with like white collar defense experience. Like DJ Envy definitely has the the best route by hiring uh, Massimo D'Angelo from from Blank and Rome. Like that's who you need on this kind of stuff. Is those elite, you know. Ivy League or white shoe lawyers who spend like thousands of dollars on dinner every night. But, um, but no, I'm kidding a little bit, but just, just somebody who actually has experience in white collar litigation and knows that kind of can navigate those, those systems and everything. So if Caesar has just like a, a civil lawyer in New Jersey who is, um, who is dealing with, with that, he's, he's going to need to switch them out for somebody else. But that's when these situations just become like, like, I mean, I hate to just be like a, you know, negative Nancy for Caesar, but it's like, Oh wow, God, you're screwed. Cause I mean, seriously, it's so expensive. He's not going to qualify for a, a public defender or a CJA panel, which sometimes I know everybody has like a bad, you know, view of public defenders and people call them, uh, public pretenders, but especially if a federal defender, I'm like, I, yeah, federal defenders would probably do pretty good work on these kind of cases. And they actually, you know, have more experience it, with it, but it, financially he's not going to qualify for that. So he's going to have to hire his own lawyer and whew, those people charge so much money. Like, yeah. Yeah. Somebody says, um, feds are a whole different ball game than state city legal stuff. Yeah, exactly. Like he's going to, he's, he's, he's going to have to get some, some serious legal counsel. And then the idea that he's going to go, he, he, he wants to hire legal counsel because his defense attorneys need to get him acquitted and have all the charges dropped. It's like, eh, I don't know. I mean, probably the, the best bet is kind of whittling the charges down or dealing with the dollar amount enough that you can get some kind of sentence or some kind of adjudication here that doesn't just like completely ruin his life, you know, but, um, yeah, what are uh, NB's options? Flip, cooperate, what are possible defenses? And and yeah, I mean, he really any of those. And it seems like his his defense right now and what we've seen in the the Blank and Rome uh, complaint, this here, they've got the complaint listed here, which I'm amazed when I uh, look through, um, look, look through this. I mean, to even call it an article, it's just like a press release write-up. But I mean, for Law.com to be writing up these press or press releases or, or uh, lawsuits and not even mentioning all the lawsuits against Caesar on us. I mean, they're not do mentioning all the background and they're completely falling for this Massimo D'Angelo's like game plan of going on the offensive as a defense. Like there's no way that uh, DJ Envy approached Massimo D'Angelo and was like, I am hiring you to file one defamation lawsuit. My, my only legal business here is this person that I want to sue for calling me a, uh, a fraud. It's like, no, no, he hired Massimo D'Angelo to deal with this whole thing that's going on with the feds. And part of the offensive or the defense that Mass Massimo D'Angelo is uh, plotting is to sue this guy for defamation as, you know, I, I it, it's one piece in a bigger puzzle. And it's just freaking disappointing to see law.com just fall for this stuff like not even mention the background of like caesar being you know involved in I, I i don't know whatever i just don't see the the value of it but yeah i mean it just we just don't know exactly what's going on with dj in situation i mean he could do any of those things he could he could cooperate but if he really doesn't think that he has anything to do with this which and wants to fight any kind of indictment or any kind of charges, which that seems to be the posture that he's taking with this guy that he's hired, the defamation lawsuit that he's done, which might be a reason that the feds uh, went out and arrested Caesar on a complaint instead of waiting for a grand jury indictment. Cause it's like, it, it, again, it's like, why would they, why would they want to arrest him on a complaint when they can just wait for a grand jury indictment? It's probably because at the same time they have a bunch of search warrants that they're serving for, various documents for that's the thing when you when you call it like a raid it's like oh they raided the office it's like it, it kind of becomes easy for people to play word games and try to deny that like oh there was no raid at the office the, the office was not searched it's like 
okay, so was it actually a safe within the office that was searched? I mean, I mean, something like that. You just, you just don't know. But like, like, like I said, the idea that there have been no search warrants served on this is just completely improbable. No way. There have to have been search warrants served on this. Um, what's the average cost for a federal defense attorney? It, it really can just depend on, you know, if they're, they're, high, they're, charging like a fee up front? Are they charging you hourly? Are they charging you a flat rate? But the lawyers that I know in Orange County, just through the Daily Journal, for a case like this, for like a federal white collar case, case you're looking at a couple million dollars easily for a defense team on this. And it's just, it's completely like out of the realm of, of like possibility for some people. And I had a conversation actually in a, a live I did the other day about the pros Michelle uh, case where he's filed a motion for new trial. And it's really brutal against uh, David Kenner, his lawyer at the time, saying that Kenner used artificial intelligence for his closing argument. And I actually talked to the guy, the CEO, the, the co-founder of the program, this artificial intelligence program that was used because, you know, he's kind of going on the defensive because he doesn't want all the bad publicity for his, his program. But he was talking about how his IA program is meant to level the playing field for criminal defendants and people in these white collar criminal cases. Cause especially that pros uh, Michelle case was so complicated. All his, like he was charged with like illegal campaign lobbying or foreign lobbying and it involved money laundering and things. like. It, it was just a really complex case. And it was the kind of case where you're going to have to spend a few million dollars on a big white collar criminal defense team easily. But the guy who invented the IA program's point is that the IA program is meant to kind of help and be a generative tool for smaller legal teams that can then fight these white collar criminal cases. But I'm just not sure. I, like if you have the money to spend, which these guys apparently do, don't don't buy an IA program. Buy like an actual like legal team. And that lo definitely looks to be what, what DJ Envy has done. My, my best experience with white collar criminal cases and just seeing the defense team in action was actually in 2017 when I was at the LA Daily Journal, there was a big trial starting in Orange County. It was an insider trading case in federal court and it was a CEO and a baseball player. They were best friends. They lived in the same Laguna Beach uh, neighborhood and uh, the CEO was his, um, uh, I, it was an eye doctor, or an op ophthalmology company and it was being bought by uh, another big company. There was an acquisition going on and uh, Doug DeSensei did a bunch of trades on it and made a bunch of money when the acquisition was announced and the pr price of the CEO's stock went way up. DeSensei, the baseball player, had just bought all this stock. So he was able to, I mean, it looked like insider trading. He got the inside information from his best friend, the CEO. So the CEO was on trial for insider trading and he hired the Skadden Arps uh, white collar defense team, which Skadden Arps is one of the biggest law firms in the country. I mean, like Blank and Rome, they're one of the top am law firms and the reason mazo the ceo could do that and really um uh go all out with it yeah somebody says, says oh not the whole thing with the angels yeah yeah the sensei was with the angels i mean he wasn't with the the anaheim angels when he was doing the insider trading but he was retired from the angels but uh the sensei got convicted and he had a smaller dollar uh defense team, but Mazo had insurance. Like, and, and that was when I was so early on in covering like complex cases and white collar criminal cases that it was like, wait a minute, there's insurance that pays for lawyers. But yeah, for somebody like Mazo, who's like a CEO and has like, he could have like reputational insurance or something like that, where if it's, if he gets sued or if he gets in trouble, the insurance will pay his legal fees. So that's what was going on in this insider trading trial I was watching. He had like the Skadden Arps partners. He had one of the partners that he had there from Skadden Arps, who wasn't even the main trial guy. He was arguing the law in motions. He had argued before the Supreme Court seven times. Like, I mean, this this was like a top dollar defense team. They had like 10 associates in the courtroom. They actually, the the team was from LA and the trial was like two months long in Santa Ana. So they all uh, actually rented a like a floor of a hotel room 
or of a hotel in Newport Beach. They wouldn't have to travel. And they actually had a legal secretary work full time out of the hotel. Like the money that they spent on this defense was just totally insane. But of course, if uh, Mazo had been convicted, the CEO, uh, the his insurance wouldn't have actually covered his legal fees. That's why, and they, it actually became a topic in court that they talked about outside the jury because the prosecutors were trying to argue that they should be able to tell the jury that, uh, that the insurance was paying for his legal fees and he would have like a motivation to lie and it, it, it wasn't actually allowed, but um, the final dollar amount I heard on that, that was like a 10 year case. There was a ninth circuit appeal. There was the first trial where Mazo got a, a hung jury. And then there was a second trial where Mazo got another hung jury. And then the feds just didn't pursue charges. I heard the final total for the Skadden Arps defense team over that 10 years was like $103 million. It was insane. Like that's how much the final bill for a white collar defense team for like 10 years was from Skadden Arps, $103 million. I would not expect DJ Envy to be spending that kind of money. I mean, it's not going to go that high. Because like I said, Mazo didn't even actually have that kind of money. It was his, his insurance that was uh, that was paying for it all. I forget, I forget which insurance company it was. But I mean, you can just see how, uh, how criminal defense and, and federal cases can just get way out of control. Like, I mean, you're spending tons of money on this stuff. And as somebody said in the the comments, it's like a 0.4% chance of people who actually don't get convicted at trial. I mean, a lot of people just spend tons of money on this stuff and tons of money on a defense and, and end up getting like the same result that you have. Like I'm, I'm dealing with a case right now that that has that it's the, the LA public corruption cases, the uh, here's the indictment for Pena again, but the, the LA public corruption cases, there's a developer who bribed a city councilman and he's going to prison for like six years. But I mean, he hired one of the biggest law firms. He took it to trial. He's done all this stuff. I mean, he must've just spent millions and millions of dollars on his defense and he was convicted on all charges and he's going to go to prison. Like on Thursday, he's arguing for, bail pending appeal. And I'm probably going to go just because I mean, if he doesn't get it, which I don't think he's going to, he has to go to prison like next week. And uh, yeah, a a SPF, Sam, Sam, Sam Bankman freed for sure. Yeah. That's another thing. I mean, I, and I, I, I appreciate that trial. I mean, it's getting so much coverage and it's in the Southern district of New York that I'm not going to swoop in on that one, but, um, but uh, yeah, Sam, Sam Bankman freed's another one where these white color criminal cases is just, the attorneys make so much money off it. And do the defendants really get much out of it? I guess they get prolonged freedom. I mean, instead of just taking a plea deal and going to prison early on, you know, they get a couple years of, of courtroom, courtroom antics and everything. But um, yeah, I mean, if I was Pena right now, I mean, I, 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 I can't imagine he isn't already lawyered up. I, I haven't seen enough details about his actual, uh, first court appearance to see who he was with or who he had. But I mean, this is a really, really serious case. That's why I, when I was on Twitter last night, cause I, I wasn't sure if I should do anything on this, but cause I mean, I don't, I, I at first when somebody said DJ envy, I'm just like, who, who, who are these DJs? I'm like, I I'm, I'm a DJ Carl Cox person. I like DJ Don John Digweed, Adam Bayer. I'm like, who are these like radio DJs who just like talk a lot, you know? But, uh, I, I mean, I hadn't heard of them, but uh, I mean, I've heard of the breakfast club, but th this isn't really even about them or the breakfast club. It's like, you can talk about this case well enough. If you know enough about the federal system and the wire fraud and have seen wire fraud cases before. And it's like, yeah. He, Cause when I, I, I commented that, you know, the documents were online. So I just didn't think that I had anything to add. And Somebody responded and kind of laughed and said, you know, oh, Me Megan says the, 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 you know, DJ NB case isn't that big or something like that. She was just like, kind of like joking around. And I kind of cringe because I'm like, no, no, it's really big. I mean, my first thought when I saw this, I'm like, oh, he's screwed. Because he is. Oh, yeah. Not much to say. Oh, yeah. Federal indictment. You're screwed. Like, <laughs> have fun, dude. Spend $2 million on a defense that gets you nowhere. I, but, but, but there is stuff to explore here. Like the big question of what is DJ Envy's role in this? Is he the bigger fish to fry that the feds are hoping Caesar like 
flips on and gives them information so that they can go and indict DJ Envy? Or is DJ Envy just kind of a small player in this? The way he's lawyered up with uh, Massimo D'Angelo, I am thinking that they're afraid that it, that the feds are after him. But it's kind of just a matter of uh, of time. You know, you just got to kind of see what happens when they announce an indictment and and what goes on with that. But I had to kind of laugh at some of the coverage of it because just all the, you know, were the offices raided and were they not, you know, and and TMZ uh, just being because I, I guess there was some thought that there was a job advertisement and some people were saying that, oh, the Breakfast Club must be hiring to replace DJ Envy and, and TMZ was kind of clarifying that no, no, that's not true. And it's like, does the Breakfast Club and iHeartRadio think it makes them look good that they're like not doing anything about this? Oh no, no, we haven't actually gotten rid of them, guys. Stop spreading rumors. It's like, really? You haven't gotten rid of this guy? Have you read this stuff? Like, it seems like a uh yeah. Uh, okay, yeah. Um, but if you look at some of Envy's clips he seems like an easy mark not very smart that and that could be it like that's just kind of the question of is like do the feds think he's a bigger fish than caesar pena and when you look at like all his everything that he's done he looks like to be the ringleader of it so i i don't know i mean is 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 dj envy just going to be like a witness in this whole thing oh uh, yeah see i think that's freaking unlikely like come on and and somebody who has that kind of lawyer, like you don't just get that lawyer to file a defamation lawsuit. Like he's he's definitely working behind the scenes to fight some grand jury investigation or something. But uh, this just seems pretty blatant. I mean, it's kind of your classic your classic Ponzi scheme, and you can see that it, it goes on for so long, and how they don't really realize the criminality of it because they're always hoping that, that that they'll catch a break, that they'll be able to you know, they'll get some big payout and be able to pay everything off and everything will be fine again. I mean, it's just, you see it. I mean, that's what Michael Evanati was doing. I mean, that's what, I don't know if a lot of people know the, the, the Stormy Daniels, the Nike case, the Nike case he got arrested for because um, he was he was threatening Nike saying that he was going to reveal all this unflattering information about uh, a youth basketball scandal unless they paid him like $20 million or something like that to do an internal investigation. And when I saw that figure, I was like, wow, is it really that simple? Because the 20 million figure it's like, that's pretty much exactly Evanati's debt right now. Like he had a big judgment to an old law partner that was chasing him around. That was like 15 million. He just had a bunch of debt. I'm like, and, and, and really it was, it was the classic Ponzi scheme. Like the Nike extortion case was really just part of the California Ponzi scheme because uh, Evanati was trying to extort Nike so he could get more money to like fix his whole Ponzi scheme in California. Like, um, yeah. So I heard, I heard radio. Oh, does it describe how many victims actually worked with DJ NB or were they only influenced? It does not get into too many details here. And I, I'm really expecting there to be like much more of a narrative in like an overall, uh, overall narrative in the, um, in the indictment that comes out. Uh, I, I think we'll, we'll see. We'll see more there. Um, uh, let me see here. Sorry for the, sorry for the delay. I got to go up to, uh, actually go up to LA today. There are a couple of cases starting, um, not, not today, but I got to go up and see what's going on with it is, uh, um, the conception, uh, boat tragedy. I don't know if people remember that, but it was really horrible. It was four years ago. There was a diving boat that, um, there was a fire in the boat, sunk off the coast of Santa Barbara and 34 people died. But the, uh, um, the captain is actually charged with manslaughter in federal court. Right. So that starts, uh, that starts tomorrow probably, but, um, I'm going to have to drive up there and, and see what's going on with that. It's too late to take the train, but, uh, I, I don't know if you guys have, have seen this complaint. I mean, it's definitely out there. Like the district of New Jersey put everything out there for people to, to read themselves and you can see the different schemes going on. Um, I mean, December, 2022. Yeah. This just went on for a while, you know? Uh, 
But yeah, the idea that this is just going to go away, no way. It's going to become a federal indictment. And But there's always a defense here, and, and, and the biggest defense is the dollar amount, how much the actual loss was. You know, and it and it even says here, victim two has has been repaid only a small portion of his or her investment, uh, and so the defense would of course focus on the fact that he has repaid her a little bit and, and question, you know, what what the actual criminal intent was. Um, yeah, the Breakfast Club and iHeartRadio are treading lightly because they know if they fire Envy, they're liable for civil suits. I, I would say that would just depend on what his actual contract contractual ob, ob, obligations are because I, I it just depends on what kind of contract he signed with them. That would dictate whether he has a case or not because firing somebody who got wrapped up in something like this, it's like you can't do that. I yeah, no. Um, yeah, 17 million over five years. that's what I, that was the 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 amount that i saw added up so that's that's enough to put him in prison for like a few years for sure and uh, like i said it's just a matter of how many other defendants they see and who else that they want to get wrapped up in this but the idea that dj envy isn't being looked at even if i mean you could just read through this and kind of glance at his activities over the years and, and think that he must be being looked at but then when you look at everything he's done with this blank and Rome council in the defamation lawsuit that he's filing. It's like, Oh yeah, he's definitely on the offensive as like a defensive tactic for sure. So uh, questions for what comes next, it, you know, it could be a little bit, it could be a few weeks. I mean, it could be a couple months. I mean, it, it, it's hard to say when exactly there could be an indictment against Caesar. And if there is uh, an indictment against DJ Envy, if it could, if it could happen. But I think the first thing that we're going to see is a hold on all the civil cases against uh, Pena and his wife that are going on in state court in New Jersey. Cause now that he's got a criminal case, none of those are going to go forward until after the criminal case is resolved. So uh, probably, you know, this week, next week, we'll see the case created and, and get a little more information. So um, if you guys have any questions, let me know in the chat, but uh, I was happy to, to do this and fill you guys in. You know, I just, I, I just kind of wanted to figure out the best way to, to connect with everybody who was interested in this case. And I figured uh, YouTube live would be the way to go. So I wanted to, I, I was wanting to get into more pre-made videos, uh, you know, so, something a little uh, more timeless, but for, I think those are best reserved for like case summaries. Like after the, uh, the conception trial is over, I can do a pre-made video kind of summing up how the trial went. But this DJ NB case is so fluid that if I made a, a standalone pre-made video like this, it would kind of be outdated in a little bit when there's an indictment that comes down. So, um, yeah, if, if you guys have any questions, ask away, but I, I appreciate all the info. It's just, it, it's been a little quiet lately and, you know, with everything going on in, you know, Israel and Hamas and everything, I'm like the people who are just posting dumb stuff on Twitter are so tone deaf, you know, it's like, I've just been trying to be kind of quiet on there. Cause like, if you don't have anything to say, like why just look for stuff to, to tweet. But, and that's why when, when this came out, I'm like, Oh, this seems to be getting tons of coverage. I mean, sometimes when I, when I read the complaint in the press release that the, prosecutors put out and it's like well seems like they pretty much summed it up i mean but no there's there's all this other stuff to look at with this civil cases and then just the the, the process of of what's going on i think people want want some kind of explanation on that so so i can do that for you guys but the big thing i'm doing is um like i said the the trial starts this week for the conception boat captain and i'm expecting that to get uh, a lot of attention i think that'll be a big national story when he gets convicted so uh anyway i think i'm gonna sign off here but thanks everybody for for tuning in here we'll go back uh if you look on my my twitter page i've got everything linked on there. district of new jersey put out the complaint right here there's there's really not much to to read in it but like i said i think we'll be getting a uh a new uh a new indictment soon somebody has anyone laid a complaint against dj and directly as they have with caesar i have not seen any news about lawsuits 
against Envy. If anything, the, the only thing I've seen is the lawsuit that he filed against, uh, who is it? Uh, Tony, Tony, the closer for uh, defamation for saying that he's a fraud and involved in this stuff too. But I think that's pretty obviously uh, an off uh, a defensive part of a, an overall offense like, or an offensive part of an overall defense. But um yeah so great well thanks everybody for tuning in i will see you guys the next time and uh yeah look for look for more news later on i'm not sure how much i don't think i'm going to be doing any live stuff from the courthouse for the conception trial but i'm definitely going to be doing coverage of opening statements on my uh newsletter legalaffairsandtrials.com so be sure to be sure to go online for that and uh, sign up for my mailing list. If you can here, I'll, uh, uh, there we go. But, um, the last one was, was David Kenner and Proz Michelle. I haven't actually written a story on this, uh, complaint yet, but we'll, we'll see how everything, everything fleshes out. Like I said, I thought, I thought the best way to approach this one would be to, uh, do a YouTube live and connect with you all that one. So, great on Vlad. Yeah. Vlad. I like that. I was so, um, it was like, you know, right after the, uh, the sentencing. So I was so just like fried out. I like got out there. I'm like, Oh, I'm so tired. I shouldn't be doing this. But the, the, the no jumper one, I was totally like, you know, I hadn't been doing anything all day. I just went out there and like chilled. So I was a little more, uh, a little more talkative, like a little more able to, to get into the issues on that one, but I've got another one coming out. I did something with the long beach post, uh, podcast interview yesterday that should be out, uh, soon. And I'm actually, I, uh, I don't think I'm supposed to get into all the details, but I'm being profiled right now by, by a pretty major, uh, major news outlet on the East coast. Um, they, they hung out with me here a bunch yesterday and then I'm going to see her again, uh, up in LA today and tomorrow. So I've got a lot of good things going on guys, but, uh, thanks a lot for tuning in. I'm glad I could fill you in. I love all your support. I see it. I love it. And, uh, thank you so much. Have a great day, everybody.